Hi everybody, I'm Scott, the writer and director of Skin on Skin, the rise and fall of the world's largest furrier. Great to see you again. Today I am with one of the participants in the film and one of its producers, Larry Becker. Good afternoon. Hello. Hi there. How are you? Great, thanks. How are you? I'm I'm doing well. Great. Anxious to, I'm anxious to talk. Cool. All right, well, let's start. Let's start talking. And why don't you tell us first, since you've seen the film and a lot of people who are watching maybe even haven't, what you thought of the film. Um, it wasn't exactly what I expected. You know, I remember when we first spoke about, you know, when you told me that you were you were producing this film and myself, who really wants to see this? I mean, it's a film about the fur industry and, and heavens, and I thought, well, I would. I tell you what, after seeing it, it's all about family, and everybody that's going to tune into this has one, and you know they're going to recognize that there's something here you can associate. I don't know if it's my uncle Charlie or if it's you know down the street or whatever, and you were so, but it's family. Who doesn't love a rags to riches story? But a rags to riches to collapse story? There were two Evans Furs. The one that climbed to the top of the highest peak, amazing story. And the one that tumbled from that peak decades later. But that's not the tragedy. The tragedy is what happened in between. They live the American dream, and they let a lot of people come in and live it with them. And it was a wonderful story until it wasn't. Coming from a, a generation that was so driven and willing to work 18 hours a day to be successful, there aren't that many people like that anymore. They created something out of whole cloth. And he helped kings and queens around the world with their fur coats. That was the era, uh, I would say, the golden era of department stores and specialty stores. Genetics loads the gun. But it's the environment that pulls the trigger. Non-existent parenting, and so they didn't learn how to cope with stresses. And I just look at the damage that my father created and the things that he has said. But it certainly caused a, a significant rift in the family and families, and, and you know, a number of us didn't communicate with each other for a long time. You marry into the family, you marry into the business, because that is your life. Clearly, there were problems. And, I mean, I know, knowing you, this was not an easy story to tell because very close to home. And, again, like I say, I wasn't expecting this film. This is a, a, a health and wealth. This is a film about everybody, everybody can tune into it. Everybody can feel something and take something away from you know one of, and, one of the interesting things is that it didn't start that way you know it originally was going to be about Evans furs and the rise and fall of the business which i thought in and of itself was an interesting story that that 70 year arc we have the business going to the top of the peak and then crashing oh no doubt i mean i mean that's a great story the rise and fall i mean that's a good story people want to hear that but just, but this, just as you said, the more you talk to people, the more it became about the people and their stories. And that's what emerged. And it took, well, took over as a life of its own, really. 
we ended up going from a hands-on, you know, uh, management position to being, you know, looking at a book and, and looking at reports without looking at, you know, the, the, the fur itself. So I think that that became our biggest demise. Well, I got to tell you, I mean, so the direction that you took, you know, imagine, like, what's the reaction from your family? Oh, boy. Well, um, not a thing. No. Nobody, nobody said, I love it. I hate it. You've mischaracterized things. You you know, you're speaking out of turn or you're sharing secrets we wish you hadn't have shared because they all said it live on tape. Uh, well, I, I got to admit, I got to imagine that there are stories that you did not bring to the table. Well, it's, not, it's not that I didn't bring them to the table. Um, there are a lot of, you know, I get, there's a hundred hours of tape here we're trying to distill into four hours. And so there are a lot of stories um, that just won't make it in the film. But, you know, I would tell them all if they were appropriate or fit in the essence of the film. I won't say that was the, the demise of the company, but it certainly caused a, a significant rift in the family and families and, and you know, a number of us didn't communicate with each other for a long time. Here, I'll give you an example. Uh, let me think of one for a second. Um, here, here's a funny one. You're like, now this won't make it in the film probably because it's more about me and not about anything. But um, when I went out to take your job in LA, um, after you went from LA to where, to Hong Kong or back to New York or Chicago? Or where you Went from L.A. to Chicago. Okay. So they send me out to L.A. to replace you as the assistant. Okay. And then I did that for a couple of years. And then I went to San Francisco. And then they brought me back to replace your and my mentor, who we both loved. And I really feel shitty about having partaken in that now all these years later. But Craig O'Malley and I were uh, flying out here with who was going to be, because Craig was my divisional prior, and we were flying out with who was going to be my new divisional, Bob McGrath, if you remember him. It's pretty much like the story of the rise and fall. Yeah. You know, you, yeah, you definitely remember people that live. Well, yeah, you were right. You remember the great people and you remember the, the really awful things that happen. And it's just the normal things you kind of get foggy on. But anyways, so we're flying to L.A. to... Um, to uh, have me take over that position that I was the assistant at before, as were you. And Craig and I are in the bathroom talking at the airport. And I'm like, God, I can't believe I'm going to be working for Bob McGrath. I fucking hate him. <laughs> Toilet flushed, the door to the bathroom opens, and now long him by the other Was he washing his hands or no? I don't recall, but just the fact that in typical Bob McGrath fashion, he happened, the slimy guy happened, he happened to be there. The one place we thought we could get somewhere and talk about him. Well, I'm going to tell you something. This is really going to be interesting and funny. But you know who my mentor was, Freddie. Freddie Handel? He was the guy that pushed me so... I had bruises on my back from like 19 to 20. Pushed me so hard. And he was... I remember going into a bathroom... We were at the, uh, we're having lunch with David and Sam Garber. It was they were discussing me moving to Hong Kong, and we were in the bathroom. Oh, so I said I got to go in the bathroom. Freddie goes, I'll join. And there were two things that were really funny. About this man, I just wanted to let you know, you order the most expensive thing on the menu. I said, okay, I'll do. Oh, all of a sudden, here I am, this, you know, young kid, and they're stepping me up to, to royal. Anyway, we walk into the bathroom. Freddie goes, I, I, I'm going to go to the bathroom, too. We walk into the first thing he did, look under the stall. And I said, what are you doing? And he says to me, or that nobody thinks. And he shared some interesting conversation about had to proceed but it also says something about some of the machina machinations of the um of the competitions that were going on in upper middle middle management and upper middle management here I'll, I'll give you another one that will definitely won't make it into the film when we bought uh i think it was in the um 80s the 80s ish we bought black diamond from uh, the guy who owned it ollie gintel ollie gintel 
Okay, so we buy Black Diamond for quite a bit of money. It was $10 million, $20 million. I don't remember what it was, but it was a lot of money for... Well, we had a lot of other people's money. Yeah, and it was a very prestigious, prestigious label. But anyways, I remember shortly after the sale closed, being at a breakfast in New York in the market with my grandfather and David. And I don't remember if Robert was there. And a handful of other people. Barry was probably there. And... um just celebrating the thing with all you can tell because it was a good deal for both both people at the both sides at the time. So the bill comes for this breakfast. You know what's the the bill for five or eight, seven or eight people? You know, thirty bucks, forty bucks at the time. And all you can tell grabs the bill and he goes, "Who had the toast?" <laughs> and, and he's you know like everybody's gonna pay their fine. Wait a second. Had the had the check cashed yet? Oh, yeah, I don't know. But you know, you would think the guy that you just gave twenty million to would, would treat, but in rare form, you know, these guys were all from the Depression generation, and they lived a different style of life. In nineteen eighty six, eighty seven, when I was out here in Columbus, and the business was booming. We were, um, it was it was very hot, uh, all over even in the U.S. Right, there were. TV ads, there were newspaper ads, there were magazine ads, there were articles, there were, uh, you know, entertain. Everybody was wearing fur coats. It was hot. So, uh, so tell me um, a little bit about after you did your initial interview with me um, for the film, how you felt about it, and subsequently leading into uh, a little bit about your history with Jeff and your uncle, his father, and then how that all uh, transpired. You know what? Yeah, I wasn't expecting to film Emily, and having watched opened up a lot of doors and windows closets that I had closed for a lot of years. And you know Jeff, my cousin. You know, Jeff and I we grew up together, and somehow, some way, because of the actions of it both myself and his dad. We just lost touch. I wanted no part, no contact with him. And having watched the film, and you got you got that, perfectly with the Meltzers. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. No, Scott, you got to understand. Having having watched and felt the film, real love. You, you really opened up. You opened up a passage for me that I wasn't able to find. And that was, I love this. What do I have against him? It wasn't him. And it was because of family and the way that family sometimes, well, you brought it out. You brought it out. Sometimes it's family like shit. And Again, what you're doing is exactly what I felt I was doing. I wasn't let anybody get away with it. And, and my father was ballistic and started to look closer at everything. And did not like what he saw. And he wiped his hands. He said, we're done. You, you treated family like shit and you treat shit like family. And I basically contact with the only cousin well, I have, he has a sister. Uh, the only cousin that I actually have his family that, that, you know, I was, it's family. You, you know, I mean, my take on family is it's unconditional. You know, it really and truly, dogs do it. I can't. And I was hoping some of that would come out with some of my family too, because again, we get we skim the surface of it in the first film. We'll get into it a little more in the second and third. But you know, there are people in my family who still aren't speaking to each other for twenty five or thirty years over things that happened some time ago, or recurring things that continue to happen. Because just as you said, they're unwilling to just let it go at this point and and go back to families unconditional. And I think that's one of the things you saw in the film was that. You know, these 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 six Meltzer kids were really damaged all each in their own way, but they're always there for each other, and they're always lifting each other up when they had to, and they're always going through the crises as well as the successes together. 
I'll tell you that the the family member. I mean, again, I never met Al. I loved that company so much that I would have loved Al, sure, because he was the inspiration. I'm pretty sure that Herman would have been the guy I would have connected. That man seemed to be. I don't know. He had a. Well, you know, like, you know, my grandmother used to say that in another life he would have been an artist. That you know, he had, that his merchandising talent was such that you know he could really look at something and tell what would sell. And especially as fashion is in fur fashion uh, evolved and rotated and whatnot, he really knew in February what was going to sell in December. Well, think about it. He had probably the most integral position or positioning up being in New York. Second child, Herman, suffered a long, slow decline. After a successful career supporting brother A.L. in the startup and running of Evans Furs in its first 30 years, he retired to his home in Westport, Connecticut, around the time the company went public. From there, possibly from the loss of his identity, combined with the long-term effects of being abandoned by his parents, Herman went into a slow-simmering depression that would infect the rest of his life. At the epicenter, epicenter of fashion and selector. I mean, that was... For me, I love being in Chicago. I, I love meetings. I love those lunch. And I did get to select the most expensive things on the menus. They weren't always the best. There are um, some people who didn't want to talk, and there and there are which I wish they would have. But I understand, you know, like I said, some people were devastated by what happened. And then another reason why I wanted to get all this memorialized is there were some people who wanted to talk, and I didn't get to in time, like. Case in point, somebody you and I both know is one of the most lovely, wonderful, and fun people, you know, in the right. history of the market was Donald Springer, who, you know, his his dad was, you know, the, the biggest uh, uh, sable genius in the world uh, for many, many years. But, you yeah, know, but Donald was probably the biggest marketing genius. Correct. His dad's sable. But I was, uh, partners, I was partners with him in a business. Oh, really? I lived in Hong Kong. We started a business called It's a Whole New Ball Game. And what it was, he had a friend from his country club. See, he he made it. You know what I mean? He, sh he should only rest in peace, but I'm pretty sure he's on the 18th hole right now. You know what I mean? He enjoyed his life, and, and he made it. He meets this guy on the golf course as a license for the NFL. Here I am in Hong Kong, itching to, you know, find, you know, I was a sorcerer, you know, so that was my thing. And we were friends. We used to drive, when I lived in New York, when I was the VP in New York, you know, and the, the director of the New York office, we used to drive to work together every day. It took me about two hours long. <laughs> but I enjoyed the ride. And especially the ride home. That's a whole different story. So, but yeah, so anyway, so he was going to partake in the thing. And he was, you know, he'd been ill. I'd been speaking to him the whole time he was ill. And literally three days before we were supposed to take the interview, he passed away. So, so you know, so I just want, I want this story memorialized because this is why you have to capture it. You know, so, I mean, we're getting, we're at the stage now where you're a storyteller. Let's make, let's, let's, let's not lose sight of that. You have to tell these stories. Hi, welcome. I'm Scott, and my being able to share the following true story with you is something I've wanted to do for over 20 years, since 2004. Partially, as you'll see, I wasn't prepared emotionally nor was I armed with enough evidence and understanding to be able to tell you the story properly and in its entirety. Well, you know what I love about it is we're not, we're not retelling something that's been told a thousand times. Nobody's really told the story in the 25 This is nonfiction. Yeah. This is for real. Yeah. There's so many aspects of it from the business to all the things that went on in my family and the tragedies that stem from my great grandparents. And there's just so many layers that people keep telling me they find themselves in or that they're in tears by the time the thing is over. It's not the happiest of films, but it's extremely introspective. Well, I think what it does again, it's not, that's why I say, I don't know that I could have 
told in this story as easily as you have been able to roll it out. You know what I mean? It's it's a difficult story to tell. Look, we all spent a good part of a working career. And I'm one of the people that, I mean, honestly, I will raise a flag. I, I love David. I love Robert. At the end of the day, they created me well better than could have ever you know so, so what, what what did you find about how, how did you uh, feel about seeing the contrast about how you and frankly most of the other employed people who were employees felt about my family versus what you saw the introspective introspection from the family members and the story is family it's not evan so the depth of a family existence within evans and that's the story that really is. I know the rest. Well, how about, how about families, like including yourself, including the Leitzes, including the O'Malley's? Like, there's a cause. If there's so many, there were so many legacy employees. Legacy the- Evans created. And again, see, I keep saying, I never met Al. I'm sure I would have respected him. I, I never had the opportunity. David, I respected, I revered. He made himself. You know what I mean? He really and truly, I got to give him credit. I also saw him as being a real person and, and a warm. Now, again, I'm not sure that that happened with the pillars in your family. Not, not only am I not, a positive. You know, I keep thinking, your grandfather was probably the most cheerful person ever. In my 16 years of tenure at Evan, I always remember Harold as having a smile and, and having, I think, is it Michael, Michael Idlis, your, your yeah. buddy that you grew up with? When he talks about the story about the manicure. It's 1989, and I'm a groomsman in Scott Hunter's wedding in San Francisco. So I said to myself, self, let me go downstairs and get myself a manicure and, you know, be all fancy for my brother's wedding. So I go in, I sit down, and who walks in? Harold Sussman himself. And I'm like, oh, this is heavy, man. Me and Harold getting a manicure together. I love it. So he sits down, and he goes, short and round. And I was like, what does that mean? And he was like, son, when you get a manicure, you want your nails to be short and round. If you're doing your toes, you go straight across. It was Harold. Harold was the most polished guy. I didn't realize that he had the kind of background he had. So he was destined to be polished. But why did David, that's what David looked and like David tried, yeah, but he, yeah. I'll talk to you before you even answer the finish the question. He wanted that, he wanted that generation gone and done with and retired. And my grandfather didn't want to leave. And my grandfather also wasn't totally supportive of everything David wanted to do, some of which was extreme. And, um, you know, he just wanted his, it was his time and he wanted his thing. And so they did, they ended up clashing over it several times again, out of sight of everybody. So I knew all about it. You know, um, but, you know, but yeah, what, what you would see would be joyful, cheerful hour, because you know what? They spent from, he joined in, uh, in, the, in the late 30s. The company started in 29. He joined in the late 30s after my grandmother. So he spent, you know, 30, 40 years of nothing but a climb. They didn't really know from tough times, unlike, you know, much of the economy or other business. Not again, did until, 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 we the hard time. But 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 that to me that explains it is you know they had a reason to be joyful because there was a good 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 run for thirty forty years. Oh no no doubt a lot of people literally I um the Evans family yeah. they really did you know I, I was wonderful and then again 
I was also somebody that, I mean, in as much as they treated me, human being, I didn't always treat my dad, certainly not at the end. My dad was the biggest supporter of Evan for as long as I, you know, so again, there's, there's so many stories. So, so here, I'll tell you a story. That's a story that's going to get told in the third part, which is, as I said, the story of all the legacy people. But then there's also, and this, I, you know, we've got to really explore, there's the story of all the legacy people's parents or aunts and uncles, like your father, like Al Leeds, like uh, Phil Morgan, who, you know, every, they, they, they were let go. And then the, 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 the offspring stayed. Uh, a man walks up to me and this kind of gives me a, a few questions that were kind of odd. Turns out it was David Meltzer. And I said, do you know who I am? He said, you're Mike Lerman's son. And I kind of gave a little pushback for that. And he goes, no, you're Phil Morgan's son. And there's the name. My last name is Morgan Stern, but my dad was Mike Morgan. And uh, I said, correct. He goes, you learned one thing or something to that effect. He said, don't make the same mistakes your father made. So to me, it was just, that's, that's an interesting thing also. Again, that now we're legacy people, and then the trials and tribulations of them and their family within the company, you know? And, you know, Al Leach was fired. Ken Morgenstern's father was fired. Your dad was, got, you know, like, no, you know, there's an interesting thing, too, about Evans in a lot of ways. Nobody exited. Wait a That's second. Not... Wait a second. You just reminded me. They treated those guys like family. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. And that's how they ended up. So, but, yeah. but, um, you know, it's interesting that, um, you know, that, that all those stories just existed on this other outer plane. And that's, again, goes back to why this became a story about people and not a story about an empire. And just, again, more layers of, of an onion of how it allows whoever's watching and listening to the thing to see bits and pieces of themselves and their families in it, don't you think? Yeah. That excites me. Believe me. Every time I watch and I see my dad, it it warms the cockles of my <laughs> You're a cockle wolf. No, yeah, that's awesome. That, like, that's again, that's one of the things that made it special more than just a family run business by this family. There were a lot of other families in there, you know, uh, Max, you don't need Rosenblatt. I mean, there's just so many that every time you think about it, there's more and more. Tell me what goes through your mind when I, when I just throw at you that in the next part, we d uh, dive heavily into the downfall and the whole anti fur thing. And tell me what you were insulated from because you were in the far east. Julius and Rose Meltzer went forward with the belief that their son's death was an accident. And this setback rocked the family during a time when Brother A.L. and Herman's Evans Furs was skyrocketing to the top of the industry. Those Meltzer kids obviously weren't taught how to cope or how to parent or, or you know, relationship skills were really lacking and that got passed down. DNA really plays a role in in any you know in anyone's well-being. All I know is that he had a photographic memory. He was brilliant, and the family loved him. So she was always you know, like I was her little doll. She loved, but she was very interesting and fun and vivacious. All of his grandchildren wrote reports on Nuremberg at some point in school. You know, someone would always have an assignment, interview some relative about something. Nonchalantly would toss a question out and the, the beads of sweat were pouring off as he's trying to answer Uncle Bernie's question. A lot of people live in fear that, you know, oh my God, is that gonna happen to me? In the end, a lot of people got hurt. A lot of customers got, got hurt because their coats weren't there. And, you know, it was it was just a bad thing. Not for nothing, 
we were supposed to be life. You know what I mean? We were following, you know, that suit. I'll never forget it. He threw this dinosaur, you know, toy dinosaur on the table. And he says, this is what Evans is. And you know what he happened to these dinosaurs? That wasn't what the legacy that he wanted for himself. He didn't want to wake up and smell the coffee. So he just, you know, he did the things that he enjoyed doing. There you go. Um, all righty, Larry Becker is in Port St. Lucie. He's also one of the, uh, I mean, the thing. one of the regular participants you'll see in the three films, Skin on Skin, The Rise and Fall of the World's Largest Furrier. I'm Scott Hunter. Thanks for joining us. Have a great day, everybody.